everybody, my name is Shoshi. Welcome to Mock Up Hell, where we will be making a mock up and then another mock up and then maybe even another mock up. Yeah! This is the second video in my emotional descent into making 1790s stays. The first video about drafting the pattern and making a cardboard mock up is up there. So, just to remind you, I will be making a pair of stays which is the name of the supportive undergarment worn in the 18th century. This pair of stays will be transitional, meaning of the period in the 1790s when stays were transitioning from the 18th century conical stays and 1780s prow front stays into the later regency stays. The transition mainly consisted of adding gores and cups to earlier shaped stays. To that end, I am using this stays pattern from Patterns of Fashion 5, written by the School of Historical Dress, and adding bust gores to it to hopefully make it look something like this, except with gores instead of gathered cups. So now I need to adapt the pattern that I made last time with the changes that I marked on the cardboard mock-up and hopefully make a fabric mock-up on my way to the final project. So here is my original pattern, drafted in the arc method talked about in Patterns of Fashion 5. And this strip on the cardboard mock-up is the amount I need to subtract from the pattern, one and a half centimeters at the waistline and three centimeters at the bust line. So that's three quarters of a centimeter at the waist on each side and one and a half at the bust on each side. This shouldn't be too hard, right? I don't want to mess with the back piece since it's very narrow at the bottom, possibly only just big enough for the needed two bones on each side of the lacing gap. And at the top, it fits in very exactly with the next piece over. And the next piece over has a bit of the same problem on that side because of the way they fit in with each other. So I will remove the needed width from these pieces and the front one. So, starting with the waist, I will remove a quarter of a centimeter at each of these three places and redraw that line, easing it until it disappears into the curve. And at the bust, I take out half a centimeter at these three places and redraw the line again. Another change I need to make is straightening out this front bottom curve and curve this up on top a bit more. Okay, those are all the changes I needed to fix the fit. Now I will make changes to adapt the 1780s pattern I was using into 1790s transitional stays. So measuring the space between the bust gores on the cardboard mock-up, I'll mark half of that measurement away from the center front top. Then the width of the bust gore itself marked away from the first mark, and then the length of the bust gore going down, parallel to the center front fold line. And then draw curves shaped like bust gores. The bust gores will be shaped like this, however I will not cut them out of this piece. I will cut gussets in this shape and insert them in slits at this position in the center front pattern piece. And hopefully that will provide more space in the bust. And now, like I did the first time in the previous video, I will copy these new and improved pattern pieces onto new parchment paper so I can keep the original draft whole and don't have to cut into it. I am following the new dotted lines I just marked. And definitely don't forget to mark them to let future us know what version they are. 1790 stays, second try. After cutting those pieces out, with paper scissors of course, I need to refer back to patterns of fashion to mark the boning placement. Now a note about boning channel width. The pattern here in the book has quite narrow bones, but the boning I have is wide zip ties at 9mm wide. This is the boning I bought for my previous days and I have quite a lot of it left and I don't want to waste it by throwing it out and buying narrower bones. Therefore I will use it! So because the boning is 9mm wide, I will make each channel 11mm wide, adding a millimeter on each side to compensate for the 1mm thickness. The boning channel placement goes thusly. A bone runs from the top edge into each tab. In the pieces where the tabs come at an angle and don't run straight down from the top, we have another small bit of boning crossing the main one. The back piece has a bone right up against the edge, then a gap for eyelets, and then more vertical bones, and also two small horizontal ones up top. For the front pattern piece we have, like the back, a bone at the edge, then a gap, and then parallel lines until we get close to the gore and then some boning fanning out. The original pattern has much more of a fanning boning placement, but that wouldn't really work well here because it would cross the gore. Now we get to talk about fabrics. We will be busting my stash. Some heavyweight denim fabric supplemented with some of this thickish gray cotton. All right, to the cutting out. Folding the fabric in four layers, two for each side of the stays, I lay the newly adjusted pattern pieces on the fabric using the grid on the original pattern piece to make sure it's on grain. Now because I made the pattern without seam allowances, I now need to mark them out on the fabric, to the sides of each pattern piece, not at the top and bottom, because in the final project the binding will overlap the fabric, negating the need for seam allowances. 
I then cut all the pattern pieces out. To transfer the boning channel markings to the fabric, I poked holes in the lines I marked and drew in the holes with disappearing marker. These markings often disappeared too early, and I spent a lot of time reapplying marks in between sewing seams. At some point I changed to pencil because that stayed where I put it. Now say hello to the sewing machine! Now we sew all along those marked channel lines. The thing to remember about sewing all these parallel lines is to always sew them in the same direction, so they don't warp. I also sewed along the lines that mark the edge of the pattern piece, so that I know where to sew the pieces to each other later on. The most frustrating pieces to do were the side front pieces, because I was basically sewing in squares between the horizontal and vertical channels. Look, it's raining finished pattern pieces! Yay! So about the center front pattern piece, <laughs> I'm going to keep it as one whole piece, not slitting it down the middle, so I don't have to mess with making any extra eyelets in this mock-up. Also, I totally messed up with the gore shape. I made the gore slope to fit the front pattern piece. However, that is wrong. The gore needs to fit into a slit, which means that both sides have to be the same length. So now I make a new gore pattern, wherein the sides are the same length as the slit. The width is unchanged, and the top is flat! To insert the gore, I first run a seam along the edges of the slit, to keep the two layers together, and then very carefully cut the slit. This first time, I lined the edge up of the slit with the seam line of the gore, for some reason not really leaving enough seam allowance, which comes back to bite me later, right side to right side, so it seems as if the gore is facing away from the slit. Then sew along the edge, right on top of the existing seam on the edge, then flip the gore over to the other side and do the same thing there. And there we go, we have two functional gores that form a bust shape. I made a bunch of mistakes. I did not leave seam allowances in all the places that needed them. The edge of the center back piece is just open to the world. For now I'll tape it down with masking tape, but for the final stays I will need to remember to add a seam allowances there. I'm not sure what actually needs to be done there though. Does it need to be faced? Do I fold the seam allowance inside? Do I fold it to the outside? That might be quite hard to do because of the curve at the edge. I will have to figure that all out by the time I make the actual stays. I really hope this tape holds. For the final version of the stays, I will bone the pieces and then sew them together. However, for the mock-up, I will sew the pieces together, make sure it more or less fits, and only then insert boning. I pinned each pattern piece to the pattern piece that goes next to it, vertically of course along the seam, and sewed along that line, removing each pin when I got to it, of course, until a stays shape began to emerge. While trying to connect pieces 3 and 4, I made a big mistake and tried to connect them like this, but it was way too long. Thankfully I figured out in the end that I actually needed to connect them like this. And apparently there are a few more places that need to be taped, because in my great wisdom, I omitted seam allowances here. And we have a whole mock-up! We now proceed to eyelets. These stays have spiral lacing, meaning the lace will form a zigzag shape when closed. Therefore, the eyelets will be offset. I will insert the same amount of eyelets that are in the original pattern in Patterns of Fashion, spaced out to fit my size. The top eyelets sit just below the top of the stays, and the bottom ones will be just above the waistline, as shown in the book. On one side of the stays, there is an extra eyelet 1.5 cm down from the top, and on the other, there is an eyelet 1.5 cm up from the bottom. In order to figure out the spacing of the rest of the eyelets, I counted the amount of spaces between them, in this case 7, measured the length of my stays between the extra eyelet and the end, and divided that length by the number of spaces. I then measured out eyelets 3.4 cm away from each other. And because I couldn't find my awl, I proceeded to bone the stays with zip ties. I slide a zip tie into a channel and cut off the ends that stick out. For a channel that only has one end open, I'll first mark the angle it needs to be cut at, then cut that side. And after sliding it into the channel, cut the side that's sticking out. I won't really bother right now with securing the ends and binding, since it's only a mock-up, and I'll probably be transferring these same bones to the final project. The center back pieces have these little horizontal bones up here. They'll be easier to get in in the final version, where I'll be boning the pieces before sewing them together. For now, I was able to finagle the upper one through this little vertical opening, but for the lower one I had to rip the seam out to get to it, and then close the seam up again after inserting the bone. Wow, we're almost done with this mock-up! These stays don't have the usual shoulder straps. Instead, they have lengths of twill tape connected at the front, 
threaded through these straps on the back pieces, and then brought under the tabs to be tied at the front. For more information about that, watch this video from American Duchess about stays. I used a bit of scrap twill tape for the back bits, and just pinned them in place, because I might transfer the same bits to the final stays. Then I sewed twill tape to the shoulder extensions of the front pattern piece. I used two colors of twill tape for this because I am not sure how long they need to be, so I don't want to cut my tape. I'll just use the whole roll! Ooh, look at that! I found my awl! Now I can poke holes where I marked the eyelets. I don't need to bind them because this is just a mock-up. Then I spiral lace with whatever this cord is that I had hanging around. In one side and out the other. And try it on! Yay! Yeah, this doesn't seem to be working. The bust is too big, the gores are gaping, it's way too short on me. I have no idea what's going on here. When the stays sit here at my waist, resting on my hips, it's way too short and doesn't reach my bust. Also, while wearing them for a bit around the house, my arms and legs started to fall asleep. I believe this is because the waist measurement, which should be sitting at the smallest part on my body, is instead sitting either around my ribcage, if the stays are hoisted up to have the bust in the correct spot, or at my hips, if they sink down here. It is also possible that they're just small overall. Maybe I pulled too much on the cardboard mock-up to make it smaller? I'm starting to think that cardboard mock-up was a huge mistake and waste of time. Why did it seem long enough when I tried it on back then? Why did I ever think this would work? Who am I to think I could make the most complicated garment ever in the world? Who do I think I am? <sighs> it's okay. I'm okay. I can do this. To possibly figure out what is going on here, I posted some pictures of me in this mock-up to the 18th Century Stays Fitting Facebook group and got some advice there about how to fix this. Okay, the main problem here is that I did not draft a hip line. Stays should have four circumference measurements, as I myself said in my previous video. A bust line, a waistline, a hip line, and a bottom of the tabs line. And in my great hubris, I eliminated the hip line! Why did I do this? Stupidity? A lack of understanding of how stays work? So what I should have done is this, and I'll probably do this next time I draft stays, but basically instead of drafting the distance from the bust line to the waistline, I should have drafted the distance from the bust line to the hip line, drawn those curves according to the pattern pieces, and then measured the waistline and adjusted the width of it accordingly. Instead of that, what I actually did was measure from the bust line to the waistline, and then when I marked out the pattern shapes, Basically what I was doing was making the underbust very, very small, instead of the waistline being that size. So, back to the drawing board. Literally. For the next circle of mock-up hell, I will redraft these stays. Well, except for the top. I will copy the top and keep the placement of the waist, but not the size. Then I will lengthen this bugger a little bit at the side and more in the front and back so that I'll have some distance between the waistline and the hip line. The people on Facebook said I shouldn't lengthen it in the back, only the front, but I want a hip line in the back as well. Then I mark the end of tabs line from there. After marking the separation between the pattern pieces, I measured the waistline between gaps, and fixed the angle of the lines to give me enough space at the waistline. I also need to bring the top center front in a bit, to better support the bust and bring the gores slightly towards each other. To fix the way the back gapes away from the body, I brought the side seam in a bit, then shifted the next piece over to meet it, so that the whole thing shifts forward a bit. Lastly, I made the bust gore narrower at the top. Okay, that should work. This should be fine, right? So this time I cut the pieces out with seam allowances in all the places that needed them. I kept the boning pattern more or less the same, except for the front piece where I subtracted vertical bones and added fanning ones. I also took out extra bits of boning that didn't seem to be doing anything. I sewed the pieces together and- <laughs> Oh wait, I put the seam allowances on the wrong side here. <sighs> Alright, more tape. Also, guess what? I forgot to put in these little bones before I sewed the pieces together again. So I'll fix that. This time, when I inserted the gores, I actually left some seam allowance, so they don't rip out at the first fitting like last time. Because this mock-up is so much longer than the other one, I can't just easily transfer all the bones over. I can, however, use some of the longer ones for shorter bits in the new stays, and for everything else, I'll just need to use new boning. I used the same calculations to plot out the eyelets as I did previously, 
but this time the spaces between them are bigger because the whole piece is longer. And the last thing to do is to cannibalize the twill tape shoulder bits and lacing cord from the previous mock-up and try it on. Oh god, there are so many problems with this mock-up. So many. For starters, this is way too long. Way too long. Also, the back of the arm side is digging into me. I guess the change I made to bring it forward was a bad idea. I guess I'll have to move it back. The front of the arm side moved too far forward too. I guess because I took a centimeter out of the middle. I'll have to move that back. It's also a bit too big at the waist and underbust. Also, it sticks out in front. I guess that's because of the angle I put in the front. I'll have to move that back too. <sighs> okay, okay, I can do this. Okay, so I'll angle that back where it came from, move the front towards the back a bit, and bring the whole thing up. I drew a line on myself where I thought the hip line should be. It's basically just guesswork. I kind of try to figure out where the stays started standing away from the body and where it started constricting my hips too much. It seems that there's a slight wrinkle where that happens and I was kind of following that and kind of just guessing and then measured on the pattern from the previous hip line up to that hip line at points all along the stays. Then I took the original pattern pieces from Patterns of Fashion and drew the lines between the pieces. I split fewer tabs this time so I can put in less boning. Wait, the front line needs to be further back. It needs to be a whole shoulder strap width behind itself. So I'll put it there and straighten the front curve so that the center front comes up a bit. Wow, that side front piece is tiny. I'll move that towards the back a bit. I'm bringing in the sides of the gore a bit again by a half centimeter on each side. This time I marked the edge of the stays so I remember where to add seam allowance in the correct spots when I cut the pieces out. And I was just able to eke the whole mock-up out of the last of the gray fabric. Piecing is period. Well, it's a mock-up, so it really doesn't matter. But anyway, I put the whole thing together, like previously, except with fewer boning channels, because I really did not need that many. So for that, I slit fewer tabs, too. I also brought the bust gore slit out a little, though not as far apart as they were previously. And I actually have all the seam allowances necessary to sew the V at the top here. Woohoo! by hand because it's extremely fiddly. And there we go! Wow, I can actually work with this. <laughs> the back pieces are mostly fine, only the front piece needs adjusting. It's short in the front, but that can easily be fixed. Woohoo! I'm just bringing the front up by three centimeters at the side of the bust, moving the shoulder strap towards the center a tad, redrawing the bust slit gores to where I drew it on the mock-up further to the sides, and lengthened the gore itself to match. Thankfully, I only need to make up one pattern piece for this. Yay! Though I do need to bust out the seam ripper to switch it out. Okay, 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 we're getting there. The center front is way too high, but I can fix that by cutting down by this much. So it ends just at mid bust. So apparently that's one of the differences between stays throughout most of the 18th century and 1790s slash Regency stays. Conical 18th century stays end just above mid bust, but separated stays end just at the mid bust. Basically because they don't restrict the bust as much, and therefore if they were to end any higher than mid bust, they would need to curve back in. I'll also bring the side front seam in a tiny bit between these marks, so the underbust will fit more snugly. Okay, is that it? No, there's still a bunch of gaping here at the side bust. But I think I can fix that by taking a bit out of the bust slit, making it a wedge instead of a slit. Oh yeah, I took too much out there. It's restricting the bust area too much, and it didn't even get all the gaping out of here. <laughs> okay, this is the plan. I'll change the bust wedge back to a slit, like it was before, but take a wedge out here at the edge of the shoulder strap, changing the angle of the shoulder strap. There, that should work. And if not, I might have to put a drawstring into the neckline of the final stays, but I hope I won't have to do that and that this will work as is. I hope. I'll also straighten out the center back line here because there's a slight overlap there at the top of the back. And that's all the changes there are to make. <sighs> 
Okay, we have a pattern for the final stage and a plan. Yay! We have successfully waded through the trials and tribulations that are mock up hell. I don't have a perfectly finished mock up to show for my efforts, but that's okay because the mock up only exists to serve the final pattern, right? Right? I hope so. Anyway, see you next time in the extended saga of making 1790 stays. Or in my next video, whichever comes first. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring the bell if you'd like to get notifications about future videos. Bye! Hopefully the final project won't take as long as this one.